Hello, good evening once again. I thank you so very much for joining me once again for this show. I consider it a privilege to share God's word and an honor to come to your space, your office, your house, wherever you are watching me from. And I thank you for giving me 20 minutes, 10 to 30 minutes of your time every week. So thank you so very much. And if you are new to this show, my name is Babalola Oladokun. Every Thursday, I make it a point of duty to bring a content that will help your spiritual life move from one level to the other. So if you are just joining us, we've been talking about learning to hear God speak for quite a number of time. This is episode four, and we've covered so much ground that it's a little bit difficult to be able to say, I want to recap. But I want to encourage you to go to our Facebook page, www.facebook slash tenet, you know, or go to our own, uh, our own Facebook, our own uh, website, www.tenets.tv, or go to our page, uh, Facebook page, Tenets TV. We have all the shows there ready for you to watch. Thank you for all those who are rating. Thank you for all those who are giving us comments. I wanted to keep it coming even as I speak now. Sometimes I may not be able to respond because this is a live audience. This is a production environment as it were. I may not be able to respond, but keep the comments coming. Let's know where you are. Let's know what is, how this is blessing you, who you are, where you're talking from. After the, the show, I would do my best to respond to you. One gentleman said to me last week, I love you. I wasn't able to respond real time. I love you too. I love everyone who is supporting this work. God bless you. So let's go into today's discussion. Last week, we spoke a lot about, about solitude. And we spoke about the fact that God is old school. We actually likened God to a television or a radio station, in which case God is always broadcasting, he's always beaming. But we as human beings need to tune. And we said that, one of the ways by which we tune our spirit to God's spirit to pick the signals from his television or radio station, as it were, is solitude. We call this shut your door. And what that essentially meant is closing the door to external distractions and shutting ourselves in with God and God alone. So today we are taking the discussion further Last week we spoke about so many things that I can I don't have the time to to recap. That we spoke about the concept of the whispering spot, the fact that you need a place where God can speak and it can reverberate. But the key question is: when you close the door, what exactly happens? That must be what you are asking me. What exactly happens after I've shut my door? Yes, you may pray. Yes, you may sing. Yes, you may you may read the Word of God. But I believe that there is a lot more. One of the things we are running away from when we shut our door is the fact that we are running away from external noise. But I want to tell you that external noise is the easiest of the various types of noises to deal with. By external noise, we mean distractions around you, your wife, your spouse, your children, which are legitimate demands, work, office, noise around you, cars moving, you know, work to attend to all sort of things that may create distractions. So you may run away from those by going on a retreat, by maybe locking the door physically in a room, by taking your time to be away from all these things. But I want to tell you that there is a greater level of noise or type of noise that you need to deal with. And I'm talking about internal noise. When I say internal noise, what exactly do I mean? You see, Let's assume that I've run away from the physical noise, I've shut my door. If I'm not careful, that is not enough. If I leave my office, take a day off, and I go to a mountain or a retreat center, that does not mean noise will not follow me. The truth is that I have noise on the inside of me, and the internal noise oftentimes is much more difficult to deal with than the external noise. What do I mean by internal noise? By internal noise, I mean my own thought process, my own thoughts. 
my, my, my ideas, my plans, my aspirations, perhaps my worries, my plans for the next few years. So many of these things can follow us into the place of prayer, into the place where we want to listen to God. And if we are not careful, we find out that physically we are shut in with God, but the truth is practically we are still far away. So I can be in a room, but my mind is far away from that room. I'm struggling to concentrate on God. This is what I mean by internal noise. So today I want to talk about a flip side of solitude. Yes, we've dealt with solitude last week very well, but how do you handle internal noise? And I want to say to you that one of the ways by which we deal with internal noise is silence. So if last week's last episode was called solitude, today I call it hush. So I want to read a few scriptures even as we proceed in this topic. Let's read Psalm 46 verse 10. Very simple scripture. I'll focus on the A part. It says, he says, be still and know that I am God. He, Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 20. We've been reading this scripture a lot. A classic on how to hear God. But the Lord in his all is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. I like the amplified version. It adds to it. It says, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth hush and be silent before him. So Psalm 46 verse 10 says, be still and know that I am God. Habakkuk 2 verse 20 says, God is in his holy temple. Let the whole heart be hush and be silent before him. What does this mean? You know, when we read Psalm 46 verse 10, oftentimes we jump the aspect of understanding what the scripture actually says, and we jump to the aspect of application. So it's very easy for you to say, be still means, you know, rest from your works, don't struggle, this, that. Those are correct. But the truth is, why did he say be still? Because the people were busy, either externally or internally, the way I've analyzed before. So if we want to hear God, we need to be still. And be still means be still, be silent, be quiet. Take, a time, take some time off a lot of the activities that have kept you busy. Sometimes busy doing nothing. Habakkuk 2 verse 20 says, The Lord is in his holy temple. Let the whole earth hush and be silent. And we've read 1 Kings chapter 19 verse 11 to 12, several times. I will try not to read it in the, in the interest of time. It's the story of Elijah wanting and needing to hear God. And the Bible says there was a very powerful earthquake. There was fire. There was wind. And God was not in all of those. In spite of all the drama, all the spectacular activities and events that followed those moves of God, God was not in it. But the Bible says at the end of the day, there was a still small voice and Elijah wrapped his face with a mantle. Again, a similitude of solitude and silence to hear God. Now, there is a principle that God showed us in that scripture, and it is this. The fact that God can intimidate us with his outside voice, but he chooses to woo us with his whisper. So God can speak loud voice like he did to the Israelites and they were intimidated. They were impressed maybe, but most of the time God wants to woo us into a very wonderful relationship by asking us to draw closer to him. And that is why he whispers. You know, before you can hear somebody whisper, you need to be close to the person. And because, before you can hear a whisper, there needs to be a lot of silence around you. The second principle we see in 1 Kings 19 is the fact that God often speaks the loudest when we are the quietest. God often speaks the loudest when we are the quietest. And I've said before that God is not going to raise his voice. You are the one that needs to reduce the voice in your life. So if solitude deals with external noise, 
silence helps us to control the internal noise on the inside of us. And I've said that perhaps silence is harder to achieve than solitude. Anybody can move away from where noise is, but it's a lot more difficult to deal with internal noise. And that is why we are talking about it today. Isaiah chapter 30 verse 15 says, For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall you be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. But, and you would not. That is an unfortunate commentary on Israel and perhaps on our generation that they will not follow the way that God has recommended, the way of quietness, the way of confidence. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, very instructive scripture. Again, it talks about the fact that when we go into the presence of God, we should not let our words be many. It says, keep your foot when you go to the house of God. And I put in bracket, maybe prayer, worship, trying to hear God and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. Be not rash with your mouth, and let not your heart be hasty to utter anything before God, for God is in heaven and you are upon the earth. Again, the principle there is the fact that when we go to the presence of God, most of us think it's all about talking and talking. No, it's more about hearing, listening to God, than us speaking. And I said last week that there is no magic. The real thing, the real magic happens when God speaks. When I speak, no power, but the power in prayer is when God speaks. And I want to encourage you that you plan for silence because it may not happen by default. Once in a while, you may stumble on it, especially if you understand the principle that I'm teaching today. But most of the time, the way our world is and the nature of the world we live in today is such that if you do not plan for silence, you will not achieve it. Once I stumbled on silence, but I was able to maximize it because I had already had a good grasp of this principle that, that I am teaching you today. I remember I traveled out of my home country and I found myself in Dubai and somehow I had made a mistake and I arrived for the training much earlier than normal. Normally we get there five hours, we get there one evening and then the next morning you go for the training. But in this situation, I had like 24 solid hours, you know, in that country. And the normal me being an introverted person, I did not go out, I did not leave my hotel room and good enough, I did not put on the television. All I did was eat, stay in the room, sleep, wake up, Maybe pray a little. It was absolute silence that I enjoyed. And at the end of the day, I heard God. Not many words, but one word he spoke and it affected my career. I want you to know that silence is not passive waiting, but it is proactive listening. Silence is not passive waiting, but proactive listening. This means that when we are waiting in the front of the presence of God, we may, it may look like time is passing. It may look like no activity either on my side or on the side of God. But the fact is that we are not wasting time. It is not passive. It is actually active listening. Yes, you may go through the phase of seeming boredom, in which case, you know, what is happening? Nothing is happening. As a learner, you go through that, but after a while, you break through that boredom, you start to enjoy the presence of God. It is not time wasted. Sometimes you hear God there and then. Sometimes it takes a while. I cannot guarantee you that every time you stay in the presence of God in silence, that a word will come. Sometimes it will happen immediately. Sometimes it's another session. But the truth is that silence in itself it's not the end result. It's not an end in itself. It's actually not our goal. It is intimacy and fellowship with God that is the goal and the end result. And there is a level of hearing God that cannot be achieved until you get into this level of intimacy. And the truth is that in any relationship, 
it is not every time that you are able to express your feelings with words. So like I said a couple of episodes ago, the fact that God can speak to us in our thoughts just as much as our thoughts ring loud in heaven than our words. So when we sit in the presence of God in silence, it does not mean that we must have many words. Sometimes we just relate to God in our thoughts. You know, you think, you meditate, you contemplate. That's what the psalmist said many, many times. The psalmist has references. He will say, my, my, my thoughts, you know, my, my, my inner thoughts goes out to God. He will talk about it in the night or in the morning. Now, again, silence is the difference between sight and insight. What do I mean by that? Everybody can see naturally, but not everybody has insight. So if you want to go further and further with God, you've got to learn to relate to him in silence. Somebody says silence is the think tank of the soul. If you want to tap into the mind of God, the special resources that heaven has, you need to learn to wait in silence. Again, somebody said, absolute silence is required to recalibrate our ears to hear God. So just like in the natural, we clean our ear once in a while. I found myself needing that several years ago. In fact, I was like partially deaf. One ear, I couldn't hear. If I turn this side, I will not hear. If I turn this side, I will hear. And I went to the hospital and they did this procedure, in which case they put something like oil or, or hot water. And I saw huge chunks of wax coming out from my ear. In the same way, that is what we need to do with God. The noise around us, classified as external and internal, as a way of blocking us, making us insensitive, hard, you know, callosed to hearing God. But we, if we stay with him in silence on a regular basis, what will happen is we will have our spirit recalibrated and we will be able to hear God. Bob Surge, the author of Secrets of the Secret Place, has this to say. He says, for this reason, I advocate a prayer life that is comprised mostly of silence. What does that mean? Most of us have defined prayer as talking to God. The prayer is a two-way thing. So you can have a heart-to-heart -heart communication with God, part of it worse, but most of it in silence. I'll give you an example. Hannah, was, she was praying in, in, in the temple. Her lips were moving, but there was no words. That is what I call contemplative prayer. Another aspect of contemplative prayer is you ask God questions. You talk to him, <coughs> excuse me, as if he is there. Anna was breaking into a new realm, so much so that Eli himself, the old prophet, did not understand. She himself had not tapped into that realm. He could not understand. He rebuked her, but we all know what the result is. The fact that, you know, that woman got what she wanted. So I've read that scripture that says that we must not have too many words when we go to the presence of God. That is not to say you cannot use words, but when you use words, make sure you also wait. Like I said before, after you shut your door in solitude, you sing, you pray, you read the Bible. What else? Most of us go back home. No. Schedule silence as part of that particular exercise that you are doing. Make sure that silence is part of the waiting on God. I've said before, waiting of God is not Waiting on God is not time wasted. It is an investment that we yield in a matter of time. A, a case in point is David. He was more or less banished to the backside of the mountain. Perhaps Moses also experienced the same thing. And that is why certain saints, even in our contemporary times, they have known the benefit of living in a serene environment. If you can afford it, fine. But if you cannot afford it, no problem. You can live in Tokyo, in Lagos, you know, in New York, in Cairo, some of the busiest cities of the world, and still practice quietness. So there are certain levels of quietness that I want to recommend. Number one is what I call planned quietness, in which case you find a quiet place, you are fully awake, but you are waiting on God. 
I don't want you to do this when you are already tired and you are in need of sleep. Very likely, you will doze off, you will not be able to get the benefit of it. That is not to say that that does not have its own advantage, but I recommend when you are fully awake. Again, take a scripture, focus on that scripture, meditate on it, not many scriptures, maybe one. Keep ruminating on it over and over and over again until you break through into the realm where God himself is speaking to you and you are hearing him. And if he does not speak, no issues, your heart is already being recalibrated, you're already having a love relationship, a fellowship with God, and it's a matter of time before he starts to speak to you. Some talks about soaking. <clears throat> Some use music, cool, quiet music. If you must use music, I must give you a, a, a caveat. Use a spirit-filled music. Don't use music from a musician that uses drugs or, you know, all sort of negative influence because your source will always be your sustenance. Use good Christian music that you can vouch for. Okay? Avoid your mind strain. Our minds sometimes or most of the times is unruly. So you need to make sure that you bring the thoughts back to the scripture that you have been meditating on. As you train yourself like this, what happens is you will find out that you have trained yourself to hear God in silence. Therefore, as a matter of time, you are actually able to hear God in the midst of chaos. The next type of quietness that we need to practice in terms of practical applications is cultivating quietness on the go. And this is what I mean by the fact that if you have learned to create chunks of time where you are just quiet and meditating on God, focusing on God, when you find yourself in the midst of noise, you are able to tune away from the noise and focus on God. I remember a wonderful testimony that one of the founding, I mean, fathers of faith in, in Christianity in my country, Nigeria, he gave a testimony. He said he was invited to a big meeting outside the country big international meeting and the pastors were put in a lounge you know they were enjoying they were having reception eating drinking each person was waiting for his turn this man said he sat in one corner did less of the banters and what did he do focused on god i like what he said about his session he said when it was my turn to minister the fire of god fell these are the secrets to encountering god i'm not saying you don't have banters but again, learn how to tune away from the noise and tune to God through silence. Another way is that in our prayers, and I think I've, I've dealt with this a lot, in your prayer sessions, make sure that you create and schedule silence as part of it. Another level of enjoying this silence and practicing it is at the corporate level. It's unfortunate that in the Pentecostal church today, I believe that we have missed this aspect of silence because we've strayed to an extreme where we are more about noise and music than silence. In fact, hardly do you have Pentecostals having silence as part of the service. And the scriptures that I've read before now attest to the fact that God perhaps dwells in silence. Silence is an aspect of relating to God. So some of our services, we should make sure that we incorporate silence. Unfortunately, in some environments, we are afraid of silence. Everything is scripted in such a way that when you finish, the next person must be ready to pick it because we are afraid to lose the people. But that may be public relations. That may be fantastic for the camera, but it's not good with our, for our relationship with God. We need silence as part and parcel of our worship to God. It is then and only then we'll be able to hear from him. So what is the application guide for this episode? Mark Butterson, the pastor of National Community Church in Washington, D.C., U.S., recommends what he calls a silent rest at the beginning of every day. This means you don't rush into the day and you don't finish the day abruptly. Silence is part and parcel of the day. I have been practicing this and I've seen tremendous improvement in my ability to hear God. At night, I deliberately go to sleep, meditating, hearing God, connecting to God in silence. And in the mornings, 
I am processing whatever it is that God has spoken to me in the night. Again, Mark recommends that we all must have what he calls a silent rest every quarter. Now, the frequency is your prerogative, whether it's every quarter, twice in a year, but what he recommends is two days of off-site retreat, your phone is switched off, you are fasting off social media, no gadget, all you want to do is listen to God. That is very difficult for a generation that is entertainment crazy and that is gadget addicted. But I, I know that if we can do it, we will benefit tremendously from it. The final word that I will give to you, Psalm 84 verse 10, a day in your court is better than a thousand. I had rather to be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Once again, thank you so very much for connecting to me and listening, giving me this few minutes to share the word. I trust it's benefiting you. If it is, help us to spread the word, share it, rate it, just create a watch party. Let your friends and relations know this is what God is saying at a time like this. So I'm, I'm not going to play any music today. Of course, I've never played. I tried, it failed at some point. Deliberately, we will go through silence as I wait for you if you have any questions. Thank you, God bless. So I'll take the questions. see okay Sharon says hmm okay I have a very very good question from Sunday Fadeyi thank you so much Sunday we used to call Sunday Father Nash uh, that's, that's a prayer warrior. So he said, how do you incorporate silence in a church program setting? Let me say this. I do not believe that this is practicable for all of our services. Because if you run a church, you will know that there are different services tailored for different events. I'll give you an example. For different events and different types of people. So an evangelistic meeting, for instance, I don't see how you can incorporate silence because an evangelistic meeting is a meeting where you are trying to draw people to know, to come and know God. You know, it's like you throw a net and then you are attracting unbelievers. At that point, unbelievers do not even understand. Maybe there are young believers there. They are not able to practice what I'm teaching you. In fact, what I'm teaching you is not a kindergarten curriculum. That's the truth. I believe it belongs a little bit to an advanced level where people who have practiced working with God over a period of time. So there are different types of meetings, but a believer's meeting, let's say a prayer meeting, should be able to benefit from this, whereby we've said a lot of prayers, but we can say, what is God saying? Like I said, a wrong definition of prayer is saying, talking to God. Prayer is a two-way thing, and none of us here will do what we do with God. I won't call you now, Tunde, and say, Tunde, how are you? Da, 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 da. Let's talk about this, da, da, da. and then drop the phone. No, I will listen to you. So what we should do is that in our prayer meetings, we should create time to listen to God, at least most of our prayer meetings. Let me give you another instance where we can benefit from this, and this is practical, I belonged to a church called New Covenant Church in, in the 1990s. That was where I grew up. If you, if you have anything like cutting your feet, as it were, that was where I learned many of the things that made me today. And immediately after the, the worship service, the worship, what we call worship, you know, the singing, the fast praise and the slow, whatever you call it, immediately after it, there will be silence. And what we normally did was, give an opportunity for people who have a word from God, 
you know, a word of encouragement, a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, and somebody will speak. The reason why we are not doing it in the church today is we've not trained the people appropriately. So if you are heading a church, you cannot do that without training the people on how to respond. A part of how to respond is, have I received a word? Because if you look at service in the New Testament context, Paul said, all of you, when you come together, you have a song, you have a word, you have a prayer, bring it. Like, uh, is it Bill Hybels that said, the way we run church today is the way sport is. You have <laughs> 20,000 people who are in desperate need of exercise, watching 22 people <laughs> who have enough exercise. So we all should be part and parcel of the services. I, I don't want to, to rant or go a rabbit trail on this. The truth is that you, you can incorporate silence into your services, depending on what type of service it is, and you need, but you need to teach the people ahead of time so that they are not frustrated. Okay, let me see if there are other, other questions. Sunde, thank you so much. I hear thank you, learned from this. Thank you too. If we are practicing silent meditation without our minds being connected to God, can it expose us to evil spirits? Wonderful question. Wonderful question coming from a wonderful person. It's a very key question in the sense that what I've done today is to compress a lot of teaching into 20, 25 minutes. Now, I can teach fully on meditation. Part of what I taught today is meditation. And when you say meditation to the Christian of today, what comes to our mind is an Eastern religion, in which case somebody is taught, hmm, be, be, be humming something, empty your mind, all of a sudden a spirit will take you over. That is arrant nonsense. It is not the Bible. However, anywhere you see a, a fake, it means that there must be an original that existed somewhere. Now, those guys are practicing an aberration of the truth, the reality. So meditation is real, but meditation is not the way those guys did it. The meditation is the way I've said it. One, you are not emptying your mind. There's nothing like emptying your mind. Nature abhors vacuum. And I've never used that word, empty your mind. What you do is you sit, you pick a scripture, and you keep focusing on it. Earlier this morning, I was awake, and I was trying to do this, and I remember a song came to me, and the song is saying something like, all I have is you, Lord. I wasn't even vocalizing it. I was just singing the song in my mind, more or less like ministering to God. That is what I mean. I'm not asking him for anything, but I'm focusing on him. That is one way to look at it. Number two, if you are a child of God, how can an evil spirit come into you? Because what I found out is most of us are afraid of these deep waters and we are running away and we are leaving this secret to intimacy with God. So evil spirit cannot take me over except there is a sin in my life. It's one of the epistles of John that said, uh, whosoever is born of God keeps himself and the evil one touches him not. Whosoever is born of God keeps himself and the evil one touches him not. So the evil one will not be able to touch you except there is sin in your life, except you are dabbling with the occult. I'm going to get to it because we are going on a long haul in this series of teachings on learning to hear God speak. So essentially, evil spirit cannot come to you if there is no legal ground. That's another thing. Devil works on legal basis. God works on legal basis. That is, the enemy cannot afflict you. The Bible says, a curse, curseless, shall not come. There must be a reason that allows the evil spirit to come and take over you. But if you are more powerful than the evil spirit, there's no way the evil spirit will come unto you. Again, I'm not talking about Eastern meditation. I'm not talking of emptying your mind. I'm talking about you focusing on the scripture in silence. Look, I have been healed physically just meditating on scriptures, healing scriptures. All right, let's leave that and see if there are other, other questions.
Perhaps a question you want to ask is, you have not asked, but I'm preempting. By the way, when my pastors first taught me this, I found it very, will I say, impractical. I revolted against it because my pastor would say to me that they are having a meeting. I would say, what are you doing? And I would say, we are waiting. I said, what do you mean? He said, we are waiting. Perhaps he could do more with explaining it to me, but he would just say, we are waiting. But I would say, what exactly? Okay, you are sitting down, you are waiting. So what happens? What if you, you, you fall off and sleep? You say, yes, some people fall off and sleep. But that, that, that's his nature. That's how he speaks. So when you are waiting on God or practicing this silence or practicing waiting on God, some people call it uh, practicing the presence of God. I'm going to give you a couple of names so that if you want to research more. One, there is a lady called Madame Guyon. Madame is spelled like French because this one was a French woman. Imagine that people like uh, James Hodgson Taylor, people like, like uh, this Chinese man, Watchman Me, and several saints like that depended on our material for growth. Now, she is one of those that pioneered it. So if you want to search, you will get loads and loads of materials written by her. Who else has walked that path? There are people who are walking that path in recent time. But back to my question of what if you fall off and slip off? Yes, it's part of it. Sometimes in God's goodness and mercy, it will still speak to you when you fall asleep. But I prefer that you do it when you are fully awake. So sometimes, you know, and that's why I said, don't do it when you're already tired. But I've been I've, I've done it when, let's say I wake up three o'clock, I pray for one hour or for two hours, and I decide to go and sleep and I practice waiting, not saying anything, but just communing in my heart with God. Maybe I drift into sleep, it affects the quality of my sleep. And sometimes I hear, it drops a word in my heart, but again, it's not about whether he speaks or he doesn't speak, it's about relationship. Okay, somebody says, how can I listen to the previous episodes Exactly, we're on Facebook now, and the station is Tenet TV, Tenet Television. If you check, you will see all the episodes. This is the fourth one, and I believe it's been a wonderful journey for us. We're actually trying to see how we can record this, package it into something that maybe you can push on television stations or other media platforms. Thank you, Tunde. Thank you for the words of encouragement. Yes, I think I'm going to type it in. Um, somebody says, oh, can you spell the name of the madam? Is madam, you are, I don't know. But the thing is that Google is very good in bringing it up. I believe I've typed it out for you. Madam Guyon, our, our writings are very powerful. Maybe a bit difficult to read because it's old, but I'm just encouraging you to, to practice this thing. I always say knowledge must turn to action no matter the cost. So we are learning, let's put it to practice. It is the truth that we practice that has the capacity to set us free. Practice, you will stumble, you will get better, but after a while, you will love it and it will become a part and parcel of you. Mojis, you are joining us late. We are finished, uh, we are rounding off, but I believe that you can catch up, you can rewatch, you can watch again uh, the, the live session that has been posted. I would like to wrap up at this point, thanking you and trying to be responsible with the time that you have given me. I want you to come back again, so I don't want to take it for granted. Thank you so very much from the bottom of my heart and the team that works with me in bringing this. I'll be your way again, same station, same time. Next week is always 6 p.m. every Thursday, Nigerian time, which is GMT plus one. Thank you. God bless you.